in order to survive and create a successful company, you've got to get over that hump of being comfortable going out there and, and pitching what you do and being proud of it and selling it. Business of Architecture, episode 412. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for building an architecture practice that empowers you to do your best work more often. This podcast is a production of Business of Architecture, the leading business consultancy for architects that helps firm owners structure their practice and their teams for freedom, creative fulfillment, and financial reward. Today's interview is with Brett Anderson, partner at the architectural lighting design firm Focus Lighting. Based in New York City, Focus Lighting has done many notable projects, which you'll hear more about on today's episode. Brett Anderson is a partner with the firm, and with that, here is today's interview with Brett Anderson. Brett, welcome to the business of architecture. How are you? I'm doing really well, Ryan. Good to talk with you. Yeah, very excited to speak to you. So you are one of the partners at Focus Lighting, an, an extraordinary lighting design company based in New York. You've, you guys work with really fascinating projects and occupy this very interesting domain of architectural lighting there's a there's an element of, of theatrics and performance and brand brand experience and you're working with you know in hospitality sectors restaurants um, I know you do a lot of residential and you've worked also in a lot of kind of exterior um, installations mm -hmm. uh, I know that you worked with one of my favorite artists, uh, um, Janet, Janet Eckelman. Yeah. Yep. Does those incredible net-like structures that occupy public spaces. And I've always thought about how on earth do you, the lighting on something like that is really like a technical wonder how you're, how you're doing it because it's so, you know, it's such a sort of ephemeral object. So you guys doing, incredibly fascinating work and I suppose the first question to to ask you is how would you describe focus lighting as a company what do, what do you do well I think um, one of the things that we really try to strive uh, to do when we are working with an architect or interior designer is truly understand what their tr what their goals are you know, what they're trying to achieve with their design and with the owner's uh, intent. And we believe that if we can really understand that, then we can uh, layer light and add light to that design to really bring it alive. Um, and, you know, in some ways we actually um, view ourselves as, as kind of the, the guardians of their vision. Um, you know, they have this big idea of what they want their project to look like, and, and they have it in their mind's eye. And, um, but the, the reality is that the, all the finishes and the colors and the materials that they choose um, are going to be rendered in some type of light. And that light is going to completely influence how their project is perceived and, and the feeling and the emotion that people have when they experience their their work and so it's we you know what we found over the years is that it's um it's very hard for an architect or an interior designer to kind of truly understand how the, how all those things combine and so our, we really view our job as um being the 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 group that that can kind of see that vision and then help them get there and then more importantly kind of guard that vision and make sure that nothing gets in the way of 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 that being successful at, at the end of the project and it's it's a very complicated thing because it's there's all these different variables that that enter into the equation um, when it comes to lighting um, and so it's it's way beyond for us at least it's it's way beyond just specifying light fixtures and making sure there's a enough mm. foot candles on a, on a, on a, pl on a surface. It's really about, um, but that combination of how light influences, how a space is perceived. Um, and that's kind of central to everything, everything we're, we're thinking about and working on. How did the company begin? And I'm imagining you, uh, you guys have been going 
over 25 years now. Over Actually, this years? is, yeah, this is going to be our 35th year. Um, 35 so, years. Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so really you were right at the, not, it's not only just the genesis of the company, but also the genesis of the industry in a sense. It was, it was early on, you know, there, um, you know, the lighting industry kind of, you know, the very earliest lighting designers, um, you know, were in, in probably in the thirties, uh, and the forties, people like Abe Fader, uh, uh, and, and so, um, you know, we were probably in that first or maybe early second wave of, of, of companies. Um, and you know, we were, our, we were founded. So our the focus lighting was founded by Paul Gregory, um, right. uh, and who is my, uh, business partner. Um, but, uh, the company was founded in 1987 and, uh, it's kind of an interesting story. His, so his background, um, was theatrical design. Uh, he went to a school in DePaul in Chicago and, um, uh, you know, graduated, was actually uh, really excited about um, doing work in theater and, and worked at regional theaters doing a theatrical lighting design. Um, you know, this was in the, you know, the, the early 70s and, um, you know, uh, also started to get involved in, in nightclub design. You know, disco was kind of the rage back then and everyone wanted amazing lighting. And, um, you know, so he he uh, ventured down that path and eventually um, uh, formed a company called Light Lab uh, with his partner uh, at the time, and they they built up an amazing company over a short span of time, uh, going from ten people to like a hundred people and uh, three different offices. Or uh, and it was incredibly successful. Um, but one of the interesting challenges was that you know Paul, who was a designer at heart. Uh, and that's really what he loved to do, quickly found himself um, doing really, you know, a lot of sales, a lot of management, and a lot of training, and a lot of running around the country um, uh, talking to all of his people and not doing a lot of design work. And that's really where his heart was. Um, so, yeah. um, you know, after, uh, after that got a little um, old for him, he decided, you know, this isn't, this isn't the right thing for me. Um, and he uh, sold his interest in that company. And that company is still around. Um, right. And he used um, he used those funds to to start Focus Lighting. Um, and it started as you know a lot of companies do. It was a small little startup in in his home uh, in downtown Manhattan, down on Worth Street, and um, grew eventually um, you know to a, a few people. He ended up moving uptown to uh, 101st and Broadway, um, and. Um, you know, I, I joined the company in 1996, um, so about uh, nine years after its its founding, and I think we were seven or eight people at that point. Um, and it was, you know, I I literally sat in the my desk was in the living room right outside of Paul's office. So, uh, you know, every every kind of, I was the first person he saw when he walked out of his office and I was the new guy, right? So I, I, I didn't have a big long list of, of things to do. So when he had, when he had a, an amazing idea or something he needed me to work on, it landed on my desk. And so we developed a, a very um, a good working relationship, even in those, those early years. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's just the, the company's grown from there. What, what was your background before you joined Focus? Similar. Um, I had gone to school for theatrical lighting design. I went to Carnegie Mellon right. in Pittsburgh. And, um, you know, I was on a similar track. I, I was doing um, uh, work in, in Summerstock Theater. I had met a lot of um, a number of the Broadway designers. I'd started to make connections. Um, my plan was I graduated from Carnegie Mellon. I moved to New York. And my plan was to start down that road, and which is a it's a daunting, very difficult um, industry to, uh, to to make a living in. Um, but I was going to mm -hmm. make a go at it. Um, yeah. And just by chance, um, my professor from Carnegie Mellon called me about, I don't know, two or three weeks after graduation and said, I've got a friend. Um, his name is Paul. He's got an architectural line design business and he needs a draftsman. You know, can, you, you want to you want to help him out? And I said, sure, I need a gig. Um, I need to do something. Um, so went and did an interview and thought I was signing up for, uh, you know, a few weeks of, of CAD drafting and, um, uh, 26 years later, here I am. 
amazing. What what was it about focus that's kept you there for so long? Because that's that's that's, know, that's really love. That's really lovely to to meet someone who you know when you've been you've spent that amount of your career, pretty much your whole working career mm -hmm. in one business. So you now understand the business. You are the business. Like it's in your it's in your bones. What was it that yeah. allowed you to to do that? You know, it's, um, I think because of um, Paul's training and what mm -hmm. he brings to his design work, the, the philosophy of um, really, tr a cl first of all, collaboration. The fact that when we were in theater, it's a very collaborative environment working with a director and scenic designer and costume designer and together trying to create a common um, experience for the audience. That same type of approach is what Paul um, sort of founded his design process uh, on. And so um, it was very easy. It was, it was a natural move. It was not foreign at all to move um, from the theater work that I had been doing to transition into architecture. The tools were a little bit different, but the physics mm -hmm. of light didn't really change. And, and the design process was very similar. So um, it, it was easy. And the, the, the thing that kept me at focus is that um, it's that process is the is the amazing part of theater that that collab everything is new every show is different every group mm -hmm. of people that you work with keeps it interesting and fresh and um, you know a lot of that same approach is what we have here in our collaboration with the architects and the interior designers that we work with. Um, you know, we're very fortunate that we work on some great projects with wonderful clients um, and collaborators, and obviously that keeps it um, exciting as well. Um, but it's um, uh, it, it's been a wonderful uh, you know 26 years, and looking forward to a lot more because it's a lot of fun. Amazing. What's been some of the the major changes in your role um, specifically? Obviously, now now you're a partner in the business. What did that career directory look like? What were some of the key sort of milestones and sort of points where your role really started to evolve from, say, just being a drafts person now to being leadership? It was a pretty, um, I, I mean, there were a few jumps, but, you know, I, I think like most people who come to Focus Lighting, I started at entry level. I was, I was, you know, I thought I was going to be a draftsman. Pretty soon I was a junior designer working with a team uh, and, and here full time. And I, and I did that for you know, a, a couple years, um, uh, just sort of understanding the trade, understanding the different tools. Um, but, you know, one of the things that Paul has always done is give um, some pretty amazing opportunities to the people that, um, he, you know, that, that, that are in his team. And, you know, so as an example, I, um, we were working um, with another lighting design firm, good friends of ours, Spears and Major, um, uh, out of uh, London. Um, and uh, uh, we were good friends with them, and they were doing work on the Burj Al Arab in Dubai. And we were right, collaborating yeah. with them um, uh, on the lighting for that. Uh, primarily, we were helping them out with the, the design and the programming of all the lighting controls. And... Um, so Paul needed someone to 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 go and and manage um, and 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 ensure that whole kit of of controls got installed correctly. So, um, you know, about eighteen months into working for Focus, I found myself uh, in Dubai, uh, uh, looking at you know one of the one of the most beautiful, tallest, iconic buildings in the world, um, and and kind of wondering why I can't believe I'm here doing this. Uh, well, isn't it like the world's first seven star hotel? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, with 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 the heliport <laughs> on top. Uh, yeah. So yeah, it um you know it's it's those kind of amazing opportunities that um you know we are we always try to give our our folks so that they can advance. So so that happened um and kind of I came back from from working in Dubai and pretty soon started designing my own projects. Um you know so I'm I uh, over the next probably. I guess it was probably four or five years of of doing that. And then an opportunity kind of opened up um, where the business was starting to get a little bit bigger. Paul mm. needed some some help and um, he, he had a, sort of a, a general manager uh, 
that, that he had brought on board, but then decided to, to sort of go back to doing theater as well. Um, and so he turned to me and said, you know, do you want to learn about the business side of things? Uh, and at first my reaction was, no, I'm, I'm a designer. That's what, that's what I do. Um, and you know, he, 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 he pushed me a little along that way. And, um, you know, next thing I know, I'm, I'm learning how to write proposals, um, and talk to clients and, uh, even look, you know, even reviewing and, and writing invoices and kind of learning the whole backside of, of the business that I had never, you know, never thought about, never been exposed to. Mm. So that was, um, that was right around 2000, 2001. Mm -hmm. Um, and that just kind of continued, you know, I, I always had, you know, I, I probably spent two years kind of pulling away from design to kind of immerse myself in, in the business side of it. Um, but once I kind of had that, uh, under my belt, then I started to get back into, um, doing more design work. Cause again, that's sort of what, what, why I got into, into doing this. Um, and things just kind of, kind of grew from there. I, it's, it was, a. um, you know, th at that point, that was what about 2002, 2003. And, you know, slowly over the course of the next, um, you know, 20 years, um, you know, I took on more and more responsibility and Paul, um, started to step back a little bit and, and, and the company mm -hmm. grew as well. That's the other thing that happened is it's, it's not, it's not just me and Paul, we've now have a team, uh, of, um, you know, principal designers who, um, who have come up through our training system and understand our approach and can represent us, um, anywhere in the world with any of our clients. And they together with uh, me and Paul really make, um, you know, they make us, uh, they make focus do, uh, what, what we're able to do successfully. How did the learning about the business aspects of the firm influence your skill set in design and how you communicated design? What were some of the insights that you started to, you know, you, if you're now faced with a new project, you're now interacting with clients, you're going to have a bit more of an understanding that the client is also a business. You, you know, you would have understood that previously, but now you're working in the mechanics of, you know, the behind the scenes, if you like. How did that, how did that start to influence the actual design process for you? I mean, it was, it was hugely beneficial. I think, um, understanding their point of view, which is not, um, universal in any means it's every client's yeah. different and, and, and takes, um, you know, a project and the collaborators that they work on and, and thinks about them differently. And so, it, you know, I think one of the really, well, actually kind of the fun things about the, 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 the business side is trying to figure out what is your client's point of view and how can you help, um, solve their particular challenge or problem, um, and present what you do and what you bring to the table in a way that they can immediately see, um, is beneficial for them. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's subtle things in terms of like how you present to that client, how you present your design, how you present the company, um, uh, to just, um, you know, phone calls and interactions and how do you navigate, um, uh, keeping a, a, a client engaged and happy and with, with what you're doing for them. Um, and that's, uh, that's something that sort of that angle and that, that, um, understanding, um, and appreciation for a, those, those differences between clients and the importance of having and understanding their point of view was something I never appreciated before I started thinking about the business side and being exposed and having conversations with, with those other, um, leaders from other companies. What was the business development aspect like for you and like entering mm -hmm. into that world? Cause that's obviously something as a, as a, as a, just a designer that you're often shielded from, yeah. you're aware of it happening and no, but it's often, it can be a bit of a mystery when you suddenly, uh, enter into it and be like, right, how do we, how do we win work now? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, I think it's, it's, it's really kind of interesting The I think one of the disadvantages of being kind of a second generation leader of a company mm -hmm. is that, um, I wasn't forced to be good and to learn how to market 
myself yep. and the company. You know, uh, in order to survive and create a successful company, you've got to get over that hump of being comfortable going out there and, and pitching what you do and being proud of it and selling it. And, um, you know, after, when you when, when you sort of start taking those reins 20 years after a company's founding and they're all Paul, you know, Paul is my partner, had already built up this incredible, successful um, uh, core group of, of clientele. Um, honestly, it was a lot easier. Um, so yeah. the, the downside about that is that because I wasn't forced to do that very difficult thing, it's a lot harder. Um, and I think that's one of the things that I'm still, honestly, still learning and working mm -hmm. through. It's, um, you know, when, when um, Paul was uh, sort of managing um, the, the bulk of the company, that the, the marketing was basically handled by him. You know, he mm -hmm. would do all the calls to editors. Um, you know, he would do all the interviews. He would um, write the award submissions. Eventually that became him and his, and his assistant. Um, we never, we did everything in house. Um, and so, you know, I looked at it and I was like, God, he's a genius. You know, he's, it's just so easy for him to do this. Um, and I don't know if it was, or if it was just that, you know, he, he sort of struggled through it and he, and he figured out a way, but it, it, it worked. Um, you know, eventually we, um, we brought on a, a full-time, uh, PR coordinator. Um, right. and then, so, you know, th that allowed us to do things that we weren't doing before. We built a new website, um, that was much more connected, much, um, much, uh, more beautiful, really did showed off our work in a, in a, in a very, um, accessible way. Um, also started getting into social media which was not something we were doing at all at that point. So, you know, first it was Facebook, then moving on to Instagram, which is really our primary um, uh, platform that we focus on just because of the visual nature of it. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, and thinking about things like search engine optimization, which is, you know, if Paul and I were um, kind of honestly oblivious to, but uh, is super important. Um, so that's, um, that that got us sort of moving and, and thinking more and getting me more engaged because I was working directly uh, with this person and I was kind of learning along the way. Um, mm -hmm. And so, um, but again, it's because, I don't know, 75% of our work is either repeat clients or referrals. Yeah. Um, so it's, um, you know, we are very fortunate that we are in a position that 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 we can rely on that base of of our clientele. You know, so when we um, COVID happened, and you know, business naturally starts to slow down a little bit, and you know, we're forced to make um, difficult decisions about you know if we if we if we have to cut a few um, staff members. Um, you know, who, who do we cut? And, um, you know, we, we, I had to make a very difficult decision, um, mm. to, to actually let go our P PR coordinator. Um, uh, and that was incredibly hard. Um, mm. and, but, um, ultimately it was the right decision. We needed to have capacity to continue doing the design work that, um, sure. we knew were, was going to come back. Um, and we did have that very reliable base of clientele that, that, um, that we had built up over the years. Um, and, and ultimately it ended up kind of creating a nice opportunity for us because as we sort of came out of the pandemic and business was picking up, we started to reevaluate, um, how we're approaching marketing and PR. Um, yeah. and I got some really good advice from the wife of one of our, co one of my colleagues, um, who's in the PR business. And, um, you know, she said, you can go do the same thing. You can hire someone, bring them in house. But the problem is you're not gonna, you're not gonna learn. You're not gonna advance what you're doing. And really you should, um, go out to a professional PR consultancy firm, bring them in, work with them, have them train you on how to approach marketing and PR. Um, and uh, lo and behold, I end up on a on a on a podcast. So uh, th thank you, Andrew <laughs> Joseph, for uh, 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 helping us out. But it's it's been a very and it's continued. This is a, still a, a sort of a fresh yeah. relationship for us, and we are and we're very much 
um, learning uh, and, and mm. trying to figure out how to better tell our story. Um, you know, that everything from how the order of posts on Instagram goes in to form, uh, you know, a, a, a beautiful composition of images when people look at all the different posts we have, um, which is something I never thought of, you know, to, to sort of just figuring out how to tell our story. You know, we historically, um, you know, before, you know, years ago when we would do things like an email blast, um, Paul uh, had, a, had a rule that um, when we would do an email blast, yes, we'd put beautiful photos in them of our work, but the readers should learn something. They should mm -hmm. get something, not just a, a beautiful image. They should learn something about light or, or architecture or, or something they can take away and tell someone else some facts. And I really appreciate that. And um, that's so we, we would always dive into that and try to we'd spend a lot of time trying to. All right. What is the thing that that and, and how can we tell someone that in a clear, compelling, concise way? And we're not writers. We're designers. Yeah. And so we'd spend an incredible amount of time writing like three paragraphs. And so it's it, working now with a professional PR, we're, we're starting to learn where is that balance? You know, mm -hmm. where it, the, between you have to give your audience and, and your potential clients something interesting for them to learn, but there is also value to, to um, getting your name out there getting it on a regular basis, very frequently. Um, and so um, it's something we are still kind of working through, but it's, I, it's, I think it was absolutely the right call to turn to someone that could look at what we're doing and, mm -hmm. and help us take it to the next level. Um, and, and Do you work with a specialist um, PR company that focuses on, on lighting or design companies, or did you approach a general um, PR consultant? Um, it, the, the consultancy that we're working with focuses mostly on the design industry. Um, right. It's a pretty broad approach, but they understand kind of our clientele and, and what they're looking for. So I think having that kind of familiarity, I think helps the conversation with us uh, a ton. And because they're, you know, their contacts are all in that industry. So it, it's, um, it, it's a very easy um, uh, dialogue back and forth and, and very helpful. So who do you typically go after, if you like, in terms of approaching a target demographic of people? Who are you most interested in communicating with? Because I guess as a, in, the, in the kind of lighting design aspect, you might not always be dealing directly with the client or you might be brought in, brought in as a sub consultant and you're working under an architect. How do you typically structure your relationships when delivering work and who's the person that you're most interested in developing a relationship with? Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, that we do have clients, um, th uh, th that are owners that, um, seek us out. They find us, um, on the web or, or again through referrals. Um, but I would say the bulk of our, our contacts, the people who reach out to us to collaborate with us are architects and interior designers. Um, and, you know, speak, and, and, you know, they, what's lovely about that is that, again, we can kind of develop a relationship with them and it, it, it you know, but we may not work with the same owner a second or third time. Um, but we will often work with that architect or that interior designer um, over and over and over again. So, um, you know, in terms of the audience, obviously they are um, a, a prime focus for, for our PR and marketing efforts. Um, I, I, um, I imagine that an owner might see, um, you know, a podcast or an article and, and, and look to hire us, but normally th the, what they're doing is they're looking for an architect and interior mm -hmm. designer. So they go hire them first. And then there's a conversation about right, who should we go to for, for lighting. So normally the best route for us is to, to develop relationships with architects and interior designers. And I, uh, yeah, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, then, then do you typically, in terms of your sales process, are you selling to the architect and then they kind of say, here's the, here's the proposal from the lighting design team and then they take it to the client or do your proposals get sent directly to the, the, the kind of the end decision maker, if you like, and what are the benefits and 
constraints? Um, it happens both ways. Um, right. You know, I, I think um, we really value the direct contact and relationship yeah. with the client. Um, when that doesn't happen, it's kind of one of our rules that, you know, that that's a, if, if you can't pick up the phone and have a, have a dialogue directly with a person um, mm -hmm. at, at the client's office that can understand what you're going for and help you solve problems, it's a, it's a bad sign. That's, that's a sign yeah. of something that's going to go wrong. So um, we, we really like having that, but you know, I, I say the majority of our contracts are written to architects, um, uh, architects of record or interior designers. And that, you know, sometimes we're folded in underneath their, you know, within their contract, or sometimes they're just the conduit and they're forwarding our proposal on to, to the owner. Sure. Um, but, um, but we, we, we want that relationship with, with both, um, both the owner and the, and the collaborator. Do you sometimes when the, an architect is kind of folding you into their their services, is that a relationship where they might be, you know, making a markup on what your services are, and they effectively become the client? And and how do you protect yourself in that kind of relationship? For example, you know, the architect is effectively the one who's paying you, but then let's say that the the owner doesn't pay the doesn't pay the architect, mm. and then are you do you find yourself in those kind of contractual situations where it's paid when get paid or how, how do you prefer to negotiate those? Yeah, it happens occasionally. Um, I, I will say it seems like that type of um, situation happens less these days than maybe it right. did 10, 15 years ago. Um, you know, we're very conscious of that possibility when we go into our contract negotiations. And, you know, like I mentioned before, we if, if we sense that that's how, like we're gonna be, you know, buried deep in the architect's proposal, that they're gonna mark it up and they're gonna, you know, th they're gonna hold, hold us at arm's length from the owner. Um, you know, we take some extra steps with that architect to explain why it's important that the lighting designer um, have this direct dialogue with an owner. Mm -hmm. Um, for the benefit of the design, but from a contractual standpoint, we, um, you know, we, we always ask for, um, a, a bit of a retainer, a bit of a deposit, um, to get yep. going. And that, and that kind of protects us for if something happens down, down the road, at the end of the project. Um, and, you know, we've been very lucky that we've learned, um, I think how to navigate, um, these kind of contractual um, issues. We've, we've certainly run into problems in years past, but we've learned from them and um, we've figured out ways to develop relationships, both with, you know, a big architect of record firm that, that, you know, has, a, you know, a dozen consultants under them, um, but still be able to, to have um, frank, um, easy dialogue with, with an owner. Um, and, and what we found is that if, if we are able to develop that, if we're able to have those conversations, that helps solve a lot of the problems that might come up down the road. One of the, one of the, one of the reasons why we have this rule of we, we always want to be talking to the, art, to, to the owner every, every couple, you know, at least every month, is that mm -hmm. that develops a relationship. You know, they're, they're going to become familiar with you. They're, they're going to be comfortable with you. And, and they're not going to, um, you know, you're, you're not just some name on a, on a contract that yeah. they, they write a check to. Um, and so it's much easier to work through this, the, the, the thorny problems that sometimes happen. What makes a good relationship between you and an architect? When does it, when does it work and when does it not work? Uh, um, it's, uh, you know, our relationships with architects, and interior designers, um, it's a, it's, it's usually not something that happens over the course of one project. Um, it is, it takes a few projects to really get into kind of a, a easy, successful groove with, mm -hmm. with, a, with a group. Um, you know, we are, um, we, we don't just, um, our approach is that we, we, we don't just layer light in on top of their design. We kind of dig in to what they're trying to, to accomplish. And then we look at, we look at everything that they're specifying. We look at the colors, the materials, the textures. We're trying to understand the composition of the, what they want people to see visually when they walk into a space, what they want them to feel. And then we kind of, we, tr we, we, we try to use light to accomplish that. But we're also 
really conscious of when things might throw that whole process off track. You know, everyone, you know, you, you go look at materials, for example. You're picking material for a back wall of, of, a, of an entryway on a, on a space, and you're doing it in a, confer- in a fluorescent lit uh, conference room. Well, that's not the light that is going to be lighting those materials. And mm. so we are always taking the materials that are being suggested by the, the architect and the interior designer. We are applying the real light that we are going to be using in the space. Um, we do that um, uh, sometimes in their office, but often in our lighting lab that we have here um, in our studios in New York. It's a double height space. It's almost like a little black box theater that uh, we can be constantly experimenting in. And so we'll, we'll light uh, their critical materials up, bring them in so they can see what it's really going to look like. And, and it, sometimes it completely changes their direction. Um, so, uh, what that means is that, you know, we're kind of pushing back, you know, we're kind of saying, no, 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 you want you want to achieve th- this, but you, the materials that you're choosing along with the light that we're going to be adding, isn't going to get you there. So you need to choose a different material. You need to choose a different color. You need to go darker. You need to think about the composition in a different way. And if you've worked with a client for three or four or five projects, and they've seen the benefit of that process, it is very easy. There's a lot of trust yeah. there on the first one. It, it, it can be a little, you know, they'll, they'll push back. And so, um, you know, I have a saying in the office that seeing is believing. And so what I, what I, what we all try to do is bring our clients into our lighting lab and turn the lights on and let them judge for themselves and, and have them be the ones to go, oh yeah, that's, that's not going to work. Not have it be us. And we just sort of create that, that opportunity for, for them to see that, um, for themselves and not, you know, be disappointed in seeing it on, on the opening day. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, the ideal client is, is uh, an ideal collaborator is someone who we've kind of developed that, that trust with, and we have this easy back and forth and they kind of rely on us for that input, um, to help make their, their design successful. Do you, do you ever have red flags that go up in these kind of preliminary conversations around a project where you and the team might be like, or your, your, your senses are like, you know what, this is not going to be the right fit. Um, you know, that happens occasionally. Um, you know, I think when the first conversation is, um, about cost, um, and not about, um, what something wants to look like or what it wants to feel like, um, Mm. that's not, you know, it's a red flag, but it's, it's not a deal breaker by any means. It just, again, we've had enough experience that we know how to talk to someone who's concentrating mostly on budget and we know how to remind them of the importance of doing a beautiful design that supports what they're trying to do and you know for for those type of clients we also spend a lot of time making them feel comfortable with what we're proposing and the and the and the costs of that um that's a really um you know, that goes hand in hand with all the creative design work that we do. We come up with all these very um, uh, creative ideas from a lighting perspective, but the very next step for us is to sit down and go, all right, what is, what is all this stuff going to cost them? Um, Because, and we, and we, we, we do that before we put pen to paper on any um, documentation. Um, And so uh, we, we figure out the costs, and we figure out a way to talk to the client about those costs. And sometimes, you know, if you're working with a big developer, they know what they spent on their last five jobs for lighting. And they know it's, you know, X number of dollars per square foot. And we give them a number and they say, that's too much or that's fine. Um, some clients don't have a, they don't know. They don't know what mm-hmm. it's to cost. And so then it's a different presentation. Then we yeah. are, we look at the f- five other projects like theirs that we've designed and we, we, we try to sort of bracket their project, you know, something a little higher, something a little lower. And, and we present, all right, here's where your, here's where our design for your project is in a cost perspective. Does it seem okay? And we mm-hmm. try to move them along so that they're, they develop a level of comfort with that because we look, if someone, if we design something that's going to cost a million dollars and we do all the documents, um, 
and then they come back and say they only have a half a million, um, you know, usually once you've documented it, there's no time. Like all, yeah. all you have time to do is, is pull out your red pen and, and cross things out. So, yeah. um, but, and, and if we had known at the beginning that they only had a half a million dollars, we would have designed the job in a, in a different way to make it successful and meet the budget. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. it's, it's kind of critical for us that we, that we, we tick that box on every project. Cause it's, it's, um, but you know, it's, you know, every project thinks about budget. Um, but, uh, you know, as long as we're talking to the clients, um, and we have a dialogue and we remind them the importance of lighting, um, you know, I think that's the other kind of interesting thing. And this is, um, you know, lighting for many, many years used to just be considered another piece of building infrastructure. It was yes. like HVAC and sprinkler systems and lighting and it, you know, all that stuff that just gets added on top of the beautiful architecture and, and, but in the last, you know, 10, 15 years, um, I think helped very much by the um, invention of LED lighting um, and and controllable lighting that you know, many of us now have in our homes from an app on our phone. Um, people are starting to appreciate how much lighting can really influence your experience, in, you know, in a space or looking at, at at a building, and so they are they are more interested in what we have to offer and how we can help a project. We still find clients that think of us as, you know, think of lighting as, as another piece of building infrastructure, but it's just a little bit of education. It's just a little bit yeah. of reminder. And again, bring them into the office and show them how much lighting can change. And, the, and the, even the, you know, the guys who have their, their noses in budgets all day long sort of go, oh, oh yeah, that's, that's great. That's beautiful. Yeah. Okay. And you, they soften up. It's, it's interesting you mentioned the um the burj the burj al arab hotel i'm i know that building quite well visited dubai many times i had a, have had family live there um and the thing that always sticks out in my mind is kind of gazing upon that building at night and mm. watching what's happening as you've got the lighting you know kind of shine up amongst those what what's it kevlar surface at the on yeah. the front of it on its belly and it and it's it's quite a thing to look at it's a very captivating the light is part of the iconic nature of it um and i guess these days lighting really is transgressing you know just a utilia you know a utilitarian um process if you like and is part of brand experience it's part of claiming the identity of what a building is and how it's perceived and the relationship that it has with the with with the wider public um and i imagine a lot more sort of sophisticated building owners and developers are kind of hyper aware of the importance of that of that brand and then lighting becomes a very a key component to that um when you're Pitching with clients, I've got a couple of questions here. Really, you know, you, you you were mentioning about designing to a budget, and you know, if they've got a different budget, then you'll adapt to your processes. How do you mitigate the risk for yourselves at the beginning of a project? Because obviously, in like in architecture, when you're writing a proposal and developing your fees, this is at the point where you know the least amount about the project. Yeah. It's only when you've been working on the project for six months when you're like, oh, okay, right. now it's unfolded about what the true scope of this is. And obviously the risk there is that you've committed yourself to too lower of a fee and the project has opened up. How do you guys protect yourself and make sure that you get the, the right fees in place for a project? Um, you know, that's something that we've, um, you know, we've learned over the years. Um, we've certainly made that mistake. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, m me personally, I, I, I have a pro I did a project in Hawaii, uh, you know, probably it was 12 years ago and, uh, and, and wrote the proposal and thought for sure I understood the scope and I proposed the fee and boy, they, they said, uh, we'll hire you right away. <laughs> and, uh, I was sort of like, oh, I wonder why wow, that was really fast. I, I wonder. And I, I learned a couple of months later that I totally misjudged, uh, the, the scope of work. Um, so it happens, but, um, it's pretty rare. And because we've, mm -hmm. we, we've developed a, a proposal process. Um, uh, we have a business manager in our office who's fantastic 
and um, we, together we kind of dive into the nitty gritty and we've learned the questions to ask to help protect us and really un, uh, understand um, uh, all the aspects of the scope that we're getting into. We also, we try to never have one source of information, you know, because mm -hmm. we have, we, usually we know somebody in that um, beyond maybe the architect of record that's called us. And so we'll try to always, you know, talk to the interior designer that we've worked with once or twice or call the owner if, if we have a relationship with them and kind of average the information. Um, and I, I think those kind of safeguard us uh, a, a little bit. Um, you know, we have to stay competitive. It's not like we can just raise our fees to, to be protective of our, our time. Sure. Um, so, you know, we, we are, there is that fine line um, from a fee perspective. And, um, but the, the other part of it is that we are, um, and this is something that I, I've worked on along with our, our team of principal designers and our staff of finding ways to do what we do successfully, but do it in as an efficient way as possible, you know, and cut out some of the, the, the things that are kind of time sucks on what we do. And, um, uh, the, you, you know, the, we, it's a it's a continual process. It's something that we're we're continually working on um, to to kind of allow us to, you know, design the jobs in, in a in a quick manner in a regular, you know, uh, five day a week. Um, you know, ho ho hopefully not much more than a, a fifty hour or fifty five hour work week. Occasionally, we we all work a little bit longer than that, but we try to have yeah. it be kind of normal and not and not insane from a from our scheduling perspective for our staff. How how big is the team at the moment? Ah, so we've got um, thirty five great creative um, designers and project managers and admin staff. Um, so not to, and we've been in the thirties for, mm -hmm. um, uh, well, probably since, uh, probably 2010. Um, and it, it's kind of a nice size for us. You know, Paul and I have talked over the years, um, about maybe trying to get bigger. Um, and there are other firms, competitors of ours that, that are, uh, getting quite large. Um, yeah. but it's, you know, Paul and I keep coming back to, you know, that's one of the lessons he learned at, at Light Lab and that you, you reach a tipping point um, with a company's growth where you, you start to lose, you start to be doing really just a lot of management and and not what you came to the company to do, which is design. Mm -hmm. And so we've found this for, at least for us, this kind of sweet spot of, of around 35, give or take um, people. It allows us to, you know, work on a, a, a lot of great projects, um, but, you know, not, you know, we can have involvement in nearly every project um, at that scale, um, any bigger, and we would start losing that kind of connection with our clients and the, and the projects. With that, how has your um, leadership role evolved going from, you know, obviously you were as, as the junior draft person and then as you, you've become partner but now also it's not just becoming a partner you're now partner of a firm that's got 35 people in it and that's you know that's a lot different from being a partner in a business that's got five people in it yeah. um what have been some of the leadership challenges or insights that you've you've developed in that career trajectory um it's actually it's very interesting so um one of the things that helped us a lot as we started to grow was that um, Paul, when the company started to get to the point where Paul couldn't have his um, eyes on every project, it was just too mm -hmm. much for him to handle. He, you know, he started delegating that to, to, to me and, and, and then eventually to um, uh, another one of my colleagues, who's now one of our principals. And, um, you know, we started thinking about, all right, what, what do I do as the leader of a company to ensure success? And he literally, you know, kind of boiled it down uh, to these uh, 14 points. Um, you know, things like, we talk, already talked about this, making sure you always talk to a client, you know, keeping up, uh, keeping up contact with a client, making sure you're doing mock-ups, 
um, and, and kind of on and on and all these kind of like, and, and the idea was that, all right, Brett, if you do these 14 things, if you keep your eye on these 14 things, chances are the projects are going to be successful. If you, if you don't pay attention to one of these things, it is go, it is likely going to create a problem. Um, and so it's really interesting that this was originally intended to be kind of like a guide, some uh, an education for, for me and for, for eventually the, the additional, uh, the other principals um, who were leading our team. And it, it certainly was, but we started realizing well, this is not just something that the leadership of the company should be thinking about. The whole company should be thinking about this. So eventually we, mm. we, we, we printed these out and we pinned, they were in every conference room. So we, we had the 14 points uh, uh, put, put up and so you'd be on the phone and you'd be you, like sort of looking up at the wall and, and going, oh, right, I got to check on budget for that job. I haven't called about that. And it's, it was just sort of perfect reminder. Can so, you share what the, what, what the 14 things are? Oh, um, I, I probably won't remember them all off the top of my head, but things like, um, you know, always look for something, a great opportunity in every project. Uh, you know, it's project big or small, there is something that we can contribute to every single project and we should identify it and we should push hard to, to make it happen. Um, we talked about budget, we talked about doing mock-ups, um, keeping client contact, you know, things like, um, you know, lighting designers sometimes can get fixated in their design by looking at it in plan. You know, they're looking yeah. at the RTP and the plan and they fail to look at and analyze the elevations of all the rooms. And right. so, you know, so you, you're laying out a hallway and you lay out down lights in the hallway every four feet on center. But what you don't realize is that there's wood paneling on the wall that's six feet wide. And, and so now the scallops of light don't match with the wood paneling. And so that's just, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a silly mistake. And, but it's an important one that we have to always, so it's, it's things like that, you know, even things like, you know, ensuring that the project is on schedule, that, um, that we're getting paid um from the client uh and so that if there is a problem getting paid um you know we have we have sort of developed a a way to work with the client that you know we have fantastic clients um it is is a rare problem um if uh, to have an issue uh, uh getting paid but every once in a while for whatever reason they don't they don't remember to write the check and so how can we um tell them in advance of way, way, way in advance of one of our issues that, hey, Mr. Owner, we really need you to, to get caught up on, on payment, um, you know, because we're going to be issuing in a month and we don't want that to affect uh, that. And so it's just all these little things that are, you know, if, if, if the, those reminders aren't there, they're easily forgotten in the, in the, in the busyness of, of getting all your work done. But mm -hmm. those, that, F, that work that Paul did to kind of grind down what made the, our early project successful was incredibly helpful to today's leadership um, in the company. Amazing. I love it. I think it's probably uh, a, a good place just to begin concluding the conversation. Uh, my last question is what's, what's planned for the rest of 2022? Ah, so um, we've uh, we've got a full docket of projects. Um, uh, the, one of the nice things um, about the end of uh, the pandemic is everyone's excited about uh, about building, and uh, um, they they want it done uh, tomorrow. Uh, and, and unfortunately, they're facing lots of hurdles like supply and uh, supply issues, but. Um, we've got uh, lots of fantastic projects, um, many of them, most of them here in the United States, a lot of work mm -hmm. out in Las Vegas, um, where the hospitality industry is, is rebuilding. Um, and so there's lots of exciting work, uh, out there. Um, and we've got a, um, uh, continuing building our private residential portfolio, um, which is a, uh, it, it's a large portion of our work. It's a very private portion of our work. It's not something you see a lot of on our website because of just the nature of the work. But um, so we're very excited about that uh, continuing to grow. Um, yeah, and we're just uh, we're excited to to stay busy. 
Love it. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much, Brett, for sharing your experience and your your story about your, your own career and leadership within Focus Lighting and, and a little bit more understanding and depth around the industry and the way that you collaborate. So that's been really fantastic. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thanks, Ryan. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. If you enjoyed today's show, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. I read every single one. Also, I'd love to get your feedback on this particular episode or the show in general, as well as your recommendations. You can reach us by emailing podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. This podcast is brought to you by Business of Architecture, a leading architect business consultancy. Access our free training on how to structure your architecture firm for more freedom, fulfillment, and financial success by going to smartpracticemethod.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, warranty, pledge, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.